Have you ever been embarrassed by the actions of another believer? Don't point if they're here with you today. (laughs) Maybe their outer appearance didn't remind you much of Jesus. Uh, A lot of you know that before I started doing what I do now, I worked in computers and worked for Hewlett Packard Company. And one of uh, my coworkers um, was socially awkward, smelly, obnoxious, and a consistent, constant witness for Jesus uh, among the people. And it, it wasn't effective. In fact, it was much the other way. In fact, I remember one day when somebody said, does he go to your church? And I said, nah, and I wanted to lie, but I didn't. When a, when a fellow believer, their outward appearance, who they are, what they say, doesn't reflect Jesus. Uh, it's bad enough when it's an individual. I remember in an entire church, I was just a kid, and my dad uh, went on a missions trip and left us with my grandparents in Rush Springs, Oklahoma, at a small Assembly of God church there that my grandfather pastored. And boy, did they, they were great in all of the gifts. All the spiritual gifts, they, I'm telling you, well, the ones that they identified as being important, they were really, really good at, but it was full of division and gossip and racial prejudice. In fact, the church was split. If you've ever been through a church split, it's terrible, and usually one group just leaves and starts another church somewhere, but in this little town, they had all invested so much in their little church, and there probably weren't over 75 of them, that when they split, they both stayed in the same church. They came the same. In fact, you had two aisles with this, or two sections with a center aisle, kind of like this, and one side was on this side, one side was on this side, and they hated each other. They didn't talk to each other. In fact, they talked over one another oftentimes during the service, and they had a yearly business meeting, and they had to bring in the sheriff uh, to make sure, seriously, this happened, that there were no fights. There was no evidence of transformed lives. Or maybe you've driven behind a car with a fish-shaped bumper sticker. You familiar with that? Christian, and they flipped you off, all right? (laughs) Key indicator there is they bought the car used, all right? That's probably what happened. (laughs) Or maybe you're flipping through the television channels and you come onto a TV preacher that's raising money and it doesn't reflect Jesus. You ever heard the verse that we shouldn't hide our light under a bushel? Well, some people should consider going ahead and hiding their light, at least turn the high beams down. Would you agree with me? Because we've missed the whole purpose of the gospel. In John 3 and verse 16, it says, for God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to be its judge. Where do we come off then thinking that we're everybody's judge. Jesus wasn't sent for that, but to be its savior. It says that God so loved the world so much that he gave his son, why? So that he could die for our sins? Yes, absolutely. So he could raise from the dead, proving that he was God by the power of the Holy Spirit without a doubt. But he also came as an example. In fact, Colossians chapter one and verse 15 says, Christ is the visible likeness of the invisible God. Jesus came so that we could see what God was like. I mean, in all the rest of the Old Testament, we didn't see God, we saw evidences of where God was and where God had been. But now in the New Testament, we have a picture of God. People say, well, what is God like? Well, look at Jesus because he is a visible expression of the invisible God. How does God respond in certain situations and with certain people? Look at Jesus, because he is the visible expression of an invisible God. And here's the catch. You and I are called to be the visible likeness of an invisible God. In fact, you may be the only Jesus that anybody sees in your workplace or maybe in your family or your community. And so we're to reflect him, and honestly, at times, I've been embarrassed by how little the guy that I look at in the mirror looks like Jesus. 
Any other testimonies to that? So in the next four weeks, we're gonna study the book of Colossians. And we're gonna grow in our faith. In fact, um, the series previous to this, we talked about our values as a church, that, that we believe that uh, everybody needs to find God and grow in their faith, discover their purpose, and then make a difference in the world. And so this whole series is gonna be about our second value, which is growing in your faith. We wanna dig deeper into Jesus. In fact, I wanna give a challenge. A lot of times when I'll do a message, I'll give you a challenge, especially if it's a series, and I wanna give you a 30-day challenge. You may be reading other things in your devotions or Bible study, that's fine, but could you add one thing to it? Could you read one chapter of Colossians every week? And then we'll kind of be on the same page and we'll be growing deeper. How many of you will join me in a 30-day challenge? I'm gonna read, for the next 30 days, I'm gonna read Colossians. Okay, great, that's awesome. I believe God's gonna transform uh, us from the inside out. Here's the key verse. In fact, next weekend, uh, the whole sermon is about this verse. In fact, this verse is kind of one of the pivotal verses in the entire New Testament. When you get this one right, everything else seems to work, and it's, uh, Colossians 2 and verse six and seven, it says, since you have accepted Christ Jesus as Lord, live in union with him. Keep your roots deep in him. Build your lives on him and become stronger in your faith as you were taught and be filled with thanksgiving. And so my point is, if we're gonna be healthy, spiritually healthy, we've gotta have deep, deep roots. Now when I read scripture because of how I'm wired up, I default to how can we spread our branches further? You know, even ARC and planning life-giving churches, and, and my mantra is this, we believe that every community on the planet needs a life-giving church, would you agree with that? And so we're doing everything, because I wanna spread those, I wanna spread the branches as far as we can, but here's the facts, is that um, if our branches overreach the depth of our roots were unhealthy. And an unhealthy tree is easily toppled. Some of you saw that during the last hurricane that came through here, and you saw trees that went over, maybe the root system wasn't deep, and so it was unhealthy and easily toppled. And so we're gonna dig deeper during this series into God's plan for you. And I'm gonna take Colossians chapter one good portion of it. What I wanna do is I wanna read about eight verses right now. A lot of times it's easy to zone out when we read a long passage of scripture, but I want you to zone in, okay? So let's zone in and take a look. Colossians 1, 1 through 8. From Paul, who by God's will is an apostle of Christ Jesus, and from our brother Timothy to God's people in Colossae, who are our faithful friends in union with Christ, May God our Father give you grace and peace. We always give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all God's people. And when the true message, the good news, first came to you, you heard about the hope that it offers. So your faith and love are based on what you hope for, which is kept safe for you in heaven. The gospel keeps bringing blessings and is spreading throughout the world just as it has among you ever since the day that you first heard about the grace of God and came to know it as it really is. You learned of God's grace from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is Christ's faithful worker on our behalf and he has told us of the love that the Spirit has given you. Okay, what I wanna do is I wanna kind of set the tone for this series. I wanna give you some background about places and people so that we'll kind of have a little better understanding of what we're talking about. So Colossians is a letter written by Paul, the apostle, to a church in a city called Colossae. Very real city, it's in Turkey today. Started by a guy named Epaphras. And so Paul was a missionary. He went, traveled all over, had a little band of people, and he'd go from place to place. And, but he'd never been to Colossae. But he had been to Ephesus. In fact, that's where he was when he wrote this letter. And Ephesus was a coastal city, kind of like Charleston. It was in western Turkey. It was the culture, cultural and entertainment and trade center 
of the region. If you wanted to have a good time or do business, you go to Ephesus, kind of like Charleston, okay? Paul rents a hall in Ephesus from noon to three every day, and he argues that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. There's a bunch of Jewish people that are living there in Ephesus, and, uh, and, and Paul goes and he, and he argues that Jesus is the Messiah. And Epaphras, apparently, he's the guy from Colossae, apparently one day comes to Ephesus. He lives in Colossae, which is about 100 miles inland. Not a lot happening there. It's kind of like Columbia. And, uh, and he comes to Ephesus, which is kind of like Charleston, maybe for some good food, maybe Lewis's barbecue or maybe some fleet landing, you know, or maybe to do business or just to hit the beach or maybe to catch a show. And somehow in Ephesus, this guy from Colossae runs into Paul's traveling preaching show. And he has an encounter with Christ and it totally transforms his life. And Epaphras is the first guy in his city to become a Christ follower. It seems kind of random. Epaphras, Colossae, first one to be a Christ follower, but it's actually very, very strategic. How many of you are the first to become a Christ follower? Maybe in your family or in your school or in your workplace? You know, sometimes it's uncomfortable when that's the case because the new culture you walk into is a little different than the culture you've been a part of, and, but actually it's strategic because if you're the first, God wants to bless everybody else through you. Look at the scripture that we just read. It says the gospel keeps bringing blessings and is spreading throughout the world. How? How? by people who are the first in their area that come to know him and the blessings of God spread. And that's the way it's been since the first day. And so what I wanna do, since it's a strategic thing and this, this life transformation, I wanna talk for a few minutes about what happens when you're changed by God's grace. What does a good reflection, Epaphras has changed, his city is, is blessed, uh, what does it look like when you're changed by God's grace? Here's the first thing. When you're changed by God's grace, you see your circumstances differently through eyes of faith. Watch what uh, Paul said to Colossians in verse three. He says, we always give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, and oh, by the way, that would be a good thing, a good place to be. He doesn't say, we, we weep when we pray for you. We are sad that we're, no, he's excited about them. And he always gives thanks, why? For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. So I was wondering, what would Paul say if he was writing a book to the church at Seacoast gathered here in South Carolina and parts of North Carolina? What would he say? Would he say the same thing? Would he say, I've heard of your fill in the blank? Would he say, I've heard of your cool building? Would he say, I've heard of your great music at all of your campuses? Or, or would he say, I've heard of your cool fashion and how that every worship leader has matching holes in their skinny jeans at exactly <laughs> the same place. You look at it here as you come out. I'm sitting right here, that's all I can see. That's about my height, right there. Just a thought. Or would he say, Seacoast, I've heard about your faith in Jesus Christ. What does that mean? What does it mean to have faith in Jesus Christ? What does it mean to have faith in anybody? You ever said, what do you think about, and you fill in the blank, what do you think about so-and-so, are they for real? You know, you ever seen somebody that's too good to be true maybe, and are they for real? Or, or somebody says, you know what, she's straight up, you can trust her, I've got faith in her. Faith is simply this. Faith in somebody means that you can trust them to tell the truth. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for somebody, are they, are they real? Do they tell the truth? Faith in God and in Christ 
simply means that I choose to believe that God is telling the truth. That's all that means. You say, well, of course I believe God. Do you? For example, when God says about you, for you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength, or personalize it. For I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is telling you the truth, that you can be a parent, that you can be an effective worker in your sports team, whatever it happens to be, that you can do all things, even when you feel like you're inadequate to do it, God says you can do it. Do you argue with him about that? Or do you just go, I believe that. I believe that God tells the truth. That's faith in Christ. Or how about this? When God says, and with his, all of his abundant wealth, Philippians 4.19, Through Christ Jesus, my God will supply all of your needs. It doesn't say he might, it says he will. Do you believe that God is telling the truth? Do you ever have a hard time believing? You know, I have friends who are going through crisis of faith, and a lot of times we go through a crisis of faith when life doesn't turn out exactly how we think it should for us or for somebody that's close to us. Um, We had a pastor that came to visit us not long ago, so we paid his way to come back here. Pastor in a large church having a crisis of faith. We said, we want you to be around some faith-filled people. And it's okay to admit if you have a crisis of faith. I I remember um, Jesus, a story about Jesus when he was gonna heal a, a loved one of a guy. And Jesus asked him, do you believe that I can do this? And the guy goes, You know, I really want to believe. (laughs) Can you help me with my unbelief? Have you ever been there? And Jesus doesn't rebuke him. He helps him with his unbelief by doing an incredible thing uh, in his his loved one's life. Uh, Abraham, in the Old Testament, had been given a promise from God. God said to Abraham, "Um, I'm gonna fix your infertility issues. And there's nothing probably closer to your heart, especially as you're, you're uh, young in marriage and want to develop your family than infertility issues. My, Debbie and I went through that. And, um, and sometimes it, it knocks your faith. And he says to him, he says, you know what? There's gonna be a family that comes through you. And he's 70 years old when he tells him this. By the time he's 99 years old, you read his story, he's tried to make things happen himself, he's screwed up relationships and all of this, and he's doubting whether God can do it. And God comes to Abraham, and he introduces himself in a new way. In Genesis 17, one, he says, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the almighty God. Obey me and always do what is right. He never introduced himself as that. The uh, Hebrew word is El Shaddai. El Shaddai, God Almighty, God Omnipotent, a God who can rejuvenate dead wombs and give babies to couples in their 90s, a God who can do anything that he wants to do. And he says, that's who I am, Abraham, and don't ever forget it. And God would say that to you and I. What do you need? If you need strength, God promises to supply it. If you need comfort, God will supply it. If you need peace, God can give you peace that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. If you need resources, God will supply it, okay? When you're tempted to doubt God's ability to do something through you, and you say, you know what, I could never do that. I'm just so frustrated, there's no way I can do what I'm supposed to be doing right now. Or God will never do that. Or it can't happen. You need to stop and ask yourself, who told you that? Because God didn't tell you that. There'll be a lot of people who will tell you what you cannot do, what you cannot be, and what you cannot have, and God is not the author of any of that. Because God is all powerful, and what he wants us to do is he wants us to have faith. If you're going to go deeper, then you've got to have faith eyes to see your circumstances differently, both yours and those around you, through eyes of faith. That's when you know you're changed by God's grace. Let me give you a second thing. You're changed by God's grace when you relate to people differently with a heart of love. 
Look what he says. He says, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your what? Your love for all God's people. I've been harping on the same thing for almost 32 years now. Here's, here's, here's what I've said from the beginning. Maturity in Christ is not measured by what you know. It's measured by who you love. You know, there are a lot of Christians that think maturity is measured by what you know. How much do you know? How many spiritual gifts do you operate in? And that's not, that's just not what the Bible says. Maturity is measured by what you know. He didn't say, or by, by who you love. He didn't say, you know what, we have heard of your faith and the fact that you know all the books of the Bible and can quote the 13th chapter of Corinthians and have completed the Beth Moore Bible study on the law of love, all six 90-minute sessions. That's all good stuff. That's not what he says. When somebody is digging deeper and their roots into Jesus, they start loving all kinds of people. They start seeing value in people that nobody else sees. You know, if you study the early church and the growth of the early church, it was amazing. It started with just a, a band of a few who followed Jesus and then it just literally exploded. And as it was exploding, there was intense persecution. And a lot of people have studied and say, how could it grow under such circumstances? And most theologians will point to two things that fueled the incredible growth of the church. And the first thing were, were epidemics, epidemics. See, they lived in cities and when epidemics would come in, when disease would come in and it would be rampant in a community, it would kill all kinds of people. And so here's what would happen, is the, the way people would deal with epidemics is they'd leave, they'd flee the cities. Just a wise thing to do. Everybody would do that except the believers. The believers would stay in the city centers because they knew that there were some people who were left who couldn't fend for themselves. And so they would take them in and they would care for them. That's where hospitals came from. And, uh, and they would care for people and sometimes God would miraculously sustain their own life in the middle of an epidemic or sometimes they would die for the cause. But the people of the city would then come back and say, we don't understand them, we don't understand their culture, we don't understand their stories and myths, but we do understand that they love people and there's something different there. And then the second thing was through adoption. Because uh, in Roman society, an infant could be abandoned without penalty or social stigma for a lot of reasons, including just how they look, being an illegitimate child or grandchild, a child of infidelity, uh, family poverty, parental conflict, or just being one of too many children. And oftentimes people would just abandon because they did not have a value of life. And the Christians would come in and they would adopt these kids. Uh, much like many of you have done in, in uh, fostering kids in, in our area, and it's still a crisis, as I read the other day, in South Carolina. But the Christians came in because they saw value in people that others didn't see. What do you say, Seacoast? We've heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and your love for all God's people. I was uh, in the foyer just a couple of weeks ago and I was talking to somebody who had just gone on a mission trip to Central America. And while they were there, they visited a prison. And there were some bad dudes in the prison. MS-13 gang members. You've heard about MS-13 and just a violent, violent, violent uh, gang that started in El Salvador. And uh, there were uh, gang members who were murderers in this prison. In fact, one of the guys uh, was just a really, really, really bad dude. He murdered, he was an assassin for the drug cartels. And so he had murdered a bunch of people and he's in here and some of our people were visiting the jail and this guy had come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And they said, they saw all the tattoos and all heard all about his reputation, but there was something about him that was changed, that was different. And the guy I was talking to said, I went and I hugged him and as I hugged him, I felt something unique and I felt the spirit of God say to me, you've gotta come back because these are my people too. You know, sometimes the people that God is calling you to love look a whole lot different than people that you enjoy loving. Would you agree with that? 
And yet he's called us to love all God's people. All God's people. You know, God didn't call us to categorize people. He called us to love all of God's people. And God's people come in a variety of packages and some are easier to love than others. Even when my kids were growing up, sometimes I would say to them, you're causing me to love you by faith right now. <laughs> Let me tell you one reason I'm so pumped about this is because I believe that the church and Seacoast specifically can make a major dent in our society right now because this is an area that is lacking. I believe our society is crumbling right now from the inside out. I am grieved about it. I don't post as much as I want to or should probably, but there are things going on that grieve me, grieve me, grieve me, grieve me. We have got such a polarized society, polarized around politics, polarized around beliefs, polarized around race. Wouldn't it be incredible if a church said, you know what, we're just gonna love. <laughs> we're gonna love everybody. Listen, this week, um, or was it a week ago, two weeks ago, or whatever, I read about Ellen DeGeneres. You heard that story, didn't you? Ellen DeGeneres, who's a talk show host, and her politics are probably way left. And she went to a football game with George Bush, whose politics are more right. And she, a picture was taken and she actually looked like she was having a good time. Imagine that. And, and then people went ape crazy on social media. How can you be with somebody like him? And they went on and they told all of those things. And Ellen DeGeneres comes back and she says, hey, how about this? I am actually a friend of George Bush. We don't believe the same thing, but we can actually be friends. Wow, that's an amazing concept because, because here's the culture we live in. We live in a cancel culture. I don't care, and it's not just, hey, the left doesn't have the corner of the market on it. The other day, uh, Joel Osteen uh, went to a Lady, Lady Gaga concert, and there were Christians that went Gaga. I'm going, get a life. <laughs> Joel Osteen, maybe he can love Lady Gaga in ways and, and uh, uh, help her to go deep in her. I have no idea what's going on. It's none of my business. I do know this, another mark of maturity is being able to hold contrasting views in your mind and not hating people. Not hating people. We live in a cancel culture. You do one thing wrong and we write you off but we serve a non-canceling God. We serve a Jesus who canceled the record of your sin, nailed it to the cross, and he elevated you. He doesn't cancel you, and we need to be like that. I long for a church, and I see it happening here, where we can hold opposing views on a lot of issues, but we love one another. And it's not the issues that are gonna cause transformation. It's the love that the society is gonna see because our society is crumbling and this stuff doesn't work. But Jesus does work. Would you say amen? amen? Okay, let me ask you this. Who's hard for you to love? Does somebody come to mind when I said that? Or maybe a group of somebodies. There's a group of somebodies that are hard for you to love. I want you during our response time to pray and ask God to give you the eyes of faith and a heart of love because that's what a transformed person has. Third thing that happens when you're changed by God's grace is you see the future differently through an attitude of hope. Look what he says. He says, when the, when the true message, the good news first came to you, you heard about the hope that it offers. So your faith and love are based on what you hope for, which is kept safe for you in heaven. Would you agree with me that if you have hope, you can recover from just about anything? If you've got hope. But when you lose hope, unless you get it back, it's game over. It's game over. Hope is the steadfast belief from deep down inside that things are gonna get better, that circumstances are gonna get better that the future is gonna be better. It's the 60-year-old guy that loses everything in a disaster. Maybe it's a 
a flood or a hurricane. I've seen these stories on, on TV before. They lose everything and they ask him, what are you gonna do? And, and he says, we're gonna start all over and we're gonna make it. And whenever I hear that, I think, you know what they are? They are. It's the cancer patient that keeps fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. And when there's almost no more strength, they fight some more, knowing that eventually it's gonna be better, that eventually there may even be a cure that's coming. It's the man who lost his job and has a family to support and knows that new employment is just around the corner so long as he keeps on looking. Because here's the truth. Hope knows that what you think about tomorrow impacts how you feel today. If you think tomorrow is gonna be worse than today or nothing's ever gonna change, let me tell you something, you'll feel bad today. But if you think there's a new day tomorrow, that there's hope tomorrow, it will lift you today. Your circumstances might not change at all today, but what you think about tomorrow will determine how you feel today. Do you understand what I'm saying? It may be Monday, but Friday's coming. <laughs> Have you ever done some mental time travel and it put you in a better mood? Maybe you, you, you're having a bad day and you thought about a day off or you thought about a vacation or you thought about what it would like to lo- feel like to lose a size or two or you thought about something that you're hoping for in the future or maybe you thought about heaven and your mood lifts and your outlook changes. That's called hope. See, hope is the difference between a victim and a survivor. Dr. Dale Archer uh, wrote an article in Psychological, Psychology Today called The Power of Hope, and he, he divided people into two categories, psychological victims and psychological survivors. Both had had bad things happen in their life. And he said psychological victims, these are individuals that are passive, pessimistic, and look to the past. They ask, who's gonna help me? They despair and are all consumed by their loss, refusing to help themselves. He said psychological survivors are those who are active and optimistic and they look to the future and they ask, how can I help myself? They grieve, which is healthy, but they continue to persevere and fight. And he said, when I figured that out, it didn't take me long to realize that my primary responsibility was to turn the victim mindset into a survivor mindset and that meant restoring or instilling hope. See, I, I just believe that. I, um, I like to define myself as a, as a hope peddler. <laughs> if you came to a church hoping to hear the bad news, you came to the wrong church because this is the good news. The good news, the gospel is the good news. You have hope because of Jesus Christ regardless of where you are, what you've done, who you are, see? So how do you restore hope? Let me give you three things real quick. First, you find faith. You find faith, that's our primary value. That's the starting point. When you realize that there is a God who is bigger than you are and he's working on your situation, it builds hope. Bible says, regardless of what happens, Roman 8, 28 says, for I know that uh, all things work together for good to them who are called. It's a family promise. You may be having bad things go on right now in your life. You may have heard bad news today. I had somebody that wrote me an email at 1.30 this morning that had a bad thing happen. Well, I wanna tell you something. Just because it's a surprise to you doesn't mean it's a surprise to God. And he's at work on a solution before you even knew that there was a problem. That's hope. That's good news. So find faith. Second thing you do is practice gratitude. Practice gratitude. Focus on what you have to be thankful for, not on what you don't have or what you've lost or what you want. Practice gratitude, do it every day. Remind yourself every day, especially when you're going through a hard time. Third thing you do is rehearse the truth, not lies, the truth. Here's what we like to rehearse. I'll never get out of this. Things aren't ever gonna change. I don't know that I'll ever feel better. Well, who told you that? Who told you that? Let me tell you what the truth is. The truth is whatever you're going through won't last forever. I know that. One of my favorite passages in scripture is, it came to pass. Now I know I'm taking it out of context, but that's all right. (laughs) It came to pass. To me that means nothing stays. (laughs) It passes. If you're having a hard time in your marriage, this this will pass. If you're having a hard time in your business, this, 
will pass. It's not gonna last forever. There are better days ahead. And then after those days, there's even better days ahead because Colossians 1.27 says, living within you is the Christ who floods you with the expectation of his glory. I love that, that picture of a, a flood that's just, just getting higher and higher of the expectation. It says God floods you with the expectation of Christ's glory. He says, this mystery of Christ embedded within us becomes a heavenly treasure chest of hope filled with the riches of glory for his people and God wants everyone to know it. No wonder we ought to be the most hope-filled people on the planet regardless of circumstances because we have been filled with a God of hope, over flooded, and there's a treasure chest of hope yet to be discovered within you. So if Paul were writing this to us, what would he hear? Would he hear about our faith, our confidence because of Jesus? Or would he hear that we're discouraged because we're believing a lie? Would he hear about our love, how we're loving our community, we're loving the difficult people around us, or would we be like everybody else in our society, loving people that are like us and only when it's convenient? Or would he hear of our hope, our great attitude that we have today based on our hope for tomorrow? Or would we be buried in circumstances and bitter at our lot in life? Well, the good news is it's never too late for a brand new start, would you agree with that? It's never too late for you 2.0, or you 3.0, or you 5.0, or you 265.0, whatever it takes. This could be the beginning of the best days of your life. Would you bow with me for prayer this morning here and all across our campuses? And I wanna do something right now that's so critical and so important. Everybody bow. Say, everybody kinda shut yourself in with God. Because there are many of us here today who are one relationship away from changing the course of your destiny. See, the things that I preached about today are promises for those who are in Christ. If you're not in Christ, it's kinda, you're on your own with that. But everything I said today, I believe is true based on God's word for those who are in Christ. And the key is get in Christ. Begin a relationship. You're one relationship from changing your entire destiny. Not just for eternity, that's true. But this stuff lives well in this life. And so I wanna challenge you, if, if, uh, if you feel distant from God right now, maybe you've never had a relationship with him, or maybe it's just been a long time and you're following him from a big distance. I want you to make a commitment today that I'm gonna follow him. Would you just raise your hand if I'm talking to you right now, because I wanna pray for you. Would you just raise your hand, okay, all over this place, in the campuses, everywhere, just raise your hand, okay. All right, I see hands everywhere. Uh, up in the upper sections, okay? All right, all right, all right. This is gonna be a critical day for you. I'm gonna pray for you, and I want you to pray along with me, if you would, right now. Father, I thank you for those who have indicated a desire to follow you. Some have never followed you. Some are following you from a great distance right now. Some of us have issues of unbelief, but we're gonna set that aside and say, God, help me in my unbelief. I wanna follow you. Just tell him that, I wanna follow you. God, we recognize our sinful state. We recognize that it's because of Jesus that we have life. And Lord, right now, we choose to follow you. God, I pray that your kingdom would come in their lives and that your will would be done in a powerful way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.